Good evening, everyone. Good evening, and welcome to the National Building Museum. My name is Scott Kratz. I'm the Vice President for Education here at the museum. And tonight, we present a program entitled A Green Building is a Healthy One, as part of our series, For the Greener Good, Conversations That Will Change the World. The kernel of this program um, was planted at a past Green Build conference. Um, at a lunch, I ended up sitting next to a senior vice president from Bank of America. And we started chatting, and um, the conversation turned to the new Bank of America Tower, One Bryant Park in New York City, um, which is um, currently pursuing a certification for Platinum LEED certified, the first Platinum LEED, would be the first Platinum LEED certified building um, skyscraper um, in the United States. And I've been doing a lot of research at the time on health in the built environment for a program we had last April on um, healthcare and sustainability. Um, and this person mentioned that they were embarking on a large study with employees at the, uh, this new skyscraper, looking to quantify how working in a green building can affect workers' physical and mental health as well as productivity. And that got me thinking. Many of us um, believe and think that working in a green building is indeed a healthier experience, but what if we could document this and have hard data to back this up? And if you could prove workers in a green building are indeed healthier, would that be enough to lower your health insurance costs? Wow, that would be a complete game changer um, when developers are thinking about or um, deciding whether to build sustain sustainably or not. That will be um, the uh, topic of tonight's discussion, and we have assembled an impressive panel uh, representing a range of backgrounds and disciplines to discuss um, these issues. We have experts in the fields of architecture, sustainability, business, economics, and health, and I look forward to an in-depth and fascinating discussion. Um, we would like to thank our funder for um, tonight's program. The For the Greener Good series is presented by the museum's sustainability partner, the Home Depot Foundation, and we'd like to thank them for the generous support of this innovative lecture series. And the series, for those of you who have been here before, um, are designed to incorporate your questions and thoughts. They're meant to be conversational in format, so you'll notice that we will break periodically from um, Q&A, um, and we encourage your thoughts and questions. Um, and one thing that I find that's particularly helpful for all the panelists, can we get an idea of who's in the audience um, and who we're speaking to? Can you raise your hands if you're architects? Great. Um, planners? Wonderful. Landscape architects? Great. Uh, members of the press? A few folks. Um, engineers? Students? You can raise your hand more than once. Um, federal or state employees? Great. Um, and finally, those involved in public health issues? Great to see. Um, okay, so on to today's program. Um, two program notes. Due to the storm that thankfully has missed Washington, D.C., um, but is savaging our neighbors to the north, Mark Nichols is unable to join us, um, but Lisa Spritz, the Senior Vice President of Corporate Workplace for Bank of America, joins us in his stead. Thank you, Lisa. Um, and our moderator today, Robert Ivey, wasn't able to join us as Amtrak has interrupted service due to the storm. Um, they're running single track as of about 11 o'clock this morning. Um, so I will have the pleasure of moderating the discussion. So let me give the quickest of introductions for everyone so we can get right into the discussion. Gregory Katz is Senior Director and Director of Climate Change Policy at Good Energies, a several billion dollar global clean energy investment firm where he leads the firm's investments in energy efficiency and green buildings. He is the founding chair of the Energy and Atmosphere Technical Advisory Group for LEED and a principal author of Green Office Buildings, A Practical Guide to Development, development um, that was written in 2005. He served as the Director of Financing for Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy at the U.S. Department of Energy. He served on numerous boards and as Sustainability Advisor to CalPERS and as founder of New Resource Bank and the American Council on Renewable Energy. And I will mention, um, after tonight's program, he will be signing copies of his latest book, Greening Our Built World, Costs, Benefits, and Strategies in the Museum Shop, or just outside the Museum Shop. Vivian Loftness is an internationally renowned researcher, author, and educator, with over 30 years of focus on environmental design and sustainability, advanced building systems and system integration, climate and regionalism in architecture, as well as design for performance in the workplace of the future. From 1994 to 2004, she was head of the School of Architecture at Carnegie Mellon University. 
She's on the board of the U.S. Green Building Council, um, the AIA Communities by Design, um, Turner Sustainability, and the Global Assurance Group of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. She's a fellow of the American Institute of Architects and is a registered architect. Uh, Lisa Spritz is a lead accredited professional and a senior vice president of corporate workplace for Bank of America in Charlotte, North Carolina. As director of the Environmental uh, Risk and Sustainability Group, she's responsible for environmental compliance and sustainability programs for the approximately 130 million square feet of space occupied by Bank of America. She works to integrate sustainability into the workplace as part of Bank of America's commitment to maintaining the workplace as a competitive advantage. She also serves on the board of directors of the U.S. Green Building Council in the finance, uh, surety, and corporate real estate seat. And finally, Michelle Moore, is the Obama administration's federal environmental executive and is responsible for promoting sustainability and environmental stewardship through the federal government's operations. Housed within the President's Council on Environmental Quality, or CEQ, um, the Office of the Federal Environmental Executive was created by executive order in 1993. Um, it stewards the implementation of President Obama's executive order on federal sustainability, working collaboratively with the Office of Management and Budget and each of the agencies through the Steering Committee on Federal Sustainability. Prior to joining the CEQ, Michelle was Senior Vice President of Policy and Public Affairs at the U.S. Green Building Council, a nonprofit organization that developed and oversees the LEED certification system. So with that, I think we're going to go ahead. Is my microphone working? There we go. Um, we have some um, the <coughs> introductory, introductory questions for um, each of our folks. Um, the, as well, to help you provide a little bit more context in addition to the, um, the introduction um, of what expertise they bring to the panel. Um, and the first question is um, for Lisa. Um, so you're, as I mentioned before, you're um, the involved in um, the, with the um, study at the Bank of America um, Tower at One Bryant Park. Mm -hmm. um, the, can you tell us, what are you measuring? What types of things are you measuring? Well, first, thank you for allowing me to sit in. Mark Nichols says hello and sends his regrets, so I'm, I'm glad I was able to uh, be here. And I should just preface it by saying that one of the reasons why this study was important to us mm -hmm. is that um, we really believe uh, that the workplace can be a competitive advantage for an employer. And so we really want to make sure that we utilize the workplace as a, uh, as a way to attract and retain uh, the best quality associates that we possibly can for our corporation. So um, it's very important to us that we have high quality workspace. And so Bank of America Tower at One Bryant Park is, is a part of that. Um, we really felt it was important though to, to engage in the conversation about how a workplace and a building can affect the health of the people who use and work and, and occupy the building. Uh, and so that's why this study was so important to us. We really felt um, strongly, you know, we always talk about the things that you know but can't prove. We really felt that we wanted to, to go down that path to, to prove um, those things that, that we know that the workplace really can affect um, the health and productivity of our workers. So we, we set up a study um, and the study is going to look at the uh, population that has moved into the building and previously these associates are 5,000 people moving into this building were in five different buildings. And some of the um, folks are moving in, who are part of this study, moving into the building. And so we're gonna look at healthcare costs before and after um, went from the old building and the new building. And um, we're also gonna look at visits to the doctor. We're gonna look at prescriptions. We're gonna look at um, possibly absenteeism, but we're gonna look at a lot of different measures to try to get a sense of um, how uh, the healthcare costs are going to change, hopefully, from the old space to the new space. Great. And we're going to unpack that a little bit more, too, because I found yep. out during our, um, the pre-meeting upstairs that um, Vivian is involved in yes. um, that study. So um, we're um, looking forward to unpacking that a little bit more. Um, thank you, Lisa, and welcome. Um, Greg. Um, all the way down there. Um, the, in the latest book um, that we mentioned, um, you're, you cite a recent study of green buildings in 11 different countries that, um, the, that demonstrates that green buildings cost just 2% more than traditional buildings to construct, yet they reduce the energy by some 33%. Um, what's the potential to reduce a company's healthcare costs for employees? Have you done those types of studies? Is the, um, and what kind of results have you found? 
Um, we have, but my publisher says to leave no promotion opportunity unturned. So uh, <clears throat> I just want to point out that this book, which is available on Amazon and here, will be signing afterwards. And there's only 204 more shopping days till Christmas. So uh, you should keep that in mind. And you don't want to shop on Amazon. You want to shop on our Absolutely. Museum shop. Absolutely. <laughs> Much better institution. Okay. And, and uh, don't forget your loved ones and your neighbors, uh, mailmen, anybody. <laughs> um, so the purpose of this study is really to address uh, whether or not green buildings are cost effective. Um, we worked with 100 architects, the largest real estate organizations, USGBC, AIA, and others. Uh, we looked at 350 buildings. We got data on 170 of them, very detailed data. And there is, um, as Scott alluded to, there is, is a cost premium. It's only 2%. The public perception is it's much higher than that. The payback is 4 to 6x over the first 20 years. Um, those benefits accrue in reduced utility bills. Energy and water are down by about 35%. Um, health is a really big one. Uh, as Lisa said, uh, the impact on health of a building that's designed to be healthy is potentially very large. Um, a couple of examples, uh, we actually tried to document in some detail what those health benefits were on a square foot basis. Uh, we found the, the, productivity, the range of productivity measures um, are very large. We came up with a very, very conservative number of 0.5% improvement in productivity translates into a couple dollars a square foot. Uh, impacts on respiratory, particularly asthma and allergy, uh, allergies and asthma. Um, health savings, things like six, sick days at school, teacher, uh, teacher uh, uh, excuse me, the, the, the cost to bring in substitute teachers. So there's a very small set of things you can quantify as benefits that relate to health, but those contribute a large, uh, largely to the, the benefits. Um, a couple things worth highlighting, um, if I may. Uh, one is there's a real experience of energy poverty in the country. 60% uh, of senior owners uh, in this country over the last five years that were interviewed um, went without medical or dental. 29% of people in the twenty to fifty thousand dollar earning range, twenty-nine percent of their funding goes to pay for automotive. So the building design, buildings where we spend eighty-five or ninety percent, has a very big secondary impact in terms of our ability to afford health, um, and that's an important factor in this. It's hard to quantify it, but it's a large number, and, and the more we quantify the benefits, the larger the benefits are. The sort of summary findings of the report were uh, speak to the current question of what we do on climate change. So there's an argument that you can't address climate change because it has an adverse impact on the economy. What we found is that a national strategy to green our buildings, both existing and new buildings, has a net present value of over a trillion dollars. It's about $10,000 a person. And by 2050, you get your 80% reduction in CO2 buildings or 45 to 50% of energy use. So that's really kind of the, the, mac the macro findings of the book. And I uh, look forward to getting into more details about it as our conversation continues. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Welcome. Um, Michelle, um, moving from private sector to public sector, mm -hmm. um, the, you're helping to lead the effort to green government facilities. Um, to what extent are you looking at um, health impacts for a greener environment for federal employees? I think that a, a really tremendously interesting and an importantly Im informative way to look at that is what the federal community has to say about that same question. Uh, just last week, uh, the president launched a, um, there's a, a video on whitehouse.gov, and the president announced the uh, final report associated with the GreenGov Challenge. Now, the GreenGov Challenge was a program that uh, was online at whitehouse.gov for about a month at the end of last year during October and November, responding to the president's executive order on sustainability. And what it asked was for members of the uh, federal and military community to come online, uh, share their best ideas about how we could green the government and meet the goals of President Obama's executive order, 
and to vote on what they felt the best ideas were that their colleagues had shared. Now, and, and I would invite any of you to, to go online and download it and take a look. I think it's very interesting, not only in the context of the federal community, but also applying that to other large organizations. But a, a very consistent theme that you see across the ideas that people shared and the ones that were the top vote getters in the GreenGov Challenge were aspects of the way that people related with their workplace. Um, it might have been uh, greening the cafeteria, you know, because people felt a uh, sense of responsibility for the styrofoam cup they might take away if they go buy a cup of coffee. Uh, in some cases, it went beyond food service items to what kind of food was being served. Uh, was the food healthy? Was it organic? Was it local? You know, these were ideas that people shared. Mm -hmm. And they also got into other connections with the workplace and what, from a um, building science perspective, would be aspects of the design that might contribute to well-being in the workplace. Um, things like making stairwells uh, friendlier and more accessible. Uh, so perhaps not in the Bank of America Tower because it's super tall, uh, but in the typical federal building around town, uh, Washington being relatively low height buildings, um, that uh, you'd want to take the stairs as opposed to the elevator, or focusing federal facilities in green locations so that not just the buildings were green, but the places that they were located, the places that we were taking leases, were supportive of sustainable communities and alternative modes of transportation getting to and from work. So it's very clearly an issue not only related to the building science uh, that goes into how we're designing, constructing, and operating our facilities, but really the way that we're encouraging our employees to interact with them. Uh, that goes directly to the relationship that we have you know, among the federal family and uh, also the way that uh, those folks are relating with their daily lives, with their jobs, and really how they feel about the places that they work. Um, I would also just add that um, you know, the, the federal community for, for a long time, for long before I joined um, the Obama administration, has long been a leader in, in green building practice. I, my colleague Don Horn is here this evening uh, from GSA. He's been one of the leading champions. And, and there are many others as well. The federal government has perhaps the, well, I don't know exactly what the statistic is. We have a lot of certified green buildings. And there's an extraordinary opportunity that's inherent in that as well to be able to contribute towards the body of knowledge about this topic as it relates to productivity, as it relates to well-being, because of course, you know, we also have an important initiative associated with open government, uh, transparency, and uh, sharing data sets that are going to be contributing towards the academic community um, and the private sector in research. So this is an area, too, where I think that we'll be able to continue to um, work to lead by example, uh, not only meeting the requirements that the president has set forth in his executive order, but also continuing the um, the history of leadership that the federal government has on this initiative and connect to some of the broader policy initiatives that we have as goals as well. Are there, before we get into the introduction question for Vivian, um, are there currently being studies being done on um, the health impact, for instance, of um, the employees working in green federal buildings? I mean, that's interesting that you say that um, the, um, the possibility of, of furthering the knowledge and furthering the data sets that are out there, or are there plans to um, the look at doing some research on um, look, uh, health impacts of, of green buildings on federal employees? Do you want to answer? Or you want me to no, you go. <laughs> or maybe that's a great transition to Vivian. Well, and actually, uh, th there is some work yeah. going on, certainly in looking at the performance and health impact yeah. of greening federal facilities, starting with the energy and water benefits, um, but also going beyond to look at, um, and, and Don Horn uh, actually probably could speak to this more clearly, because there's this whole new initiative trying to make sure that they gather a broader sweep of, of um, a more quantitative data that goes beyond the uh, utility uh, savings of, of the federal buildings. Uh, at the same time, just relative to the question of stairwells, uh, the, uh, the Department of Health in New York City, uh, and New York City is one of the major leaders in green uh, office buildings, both new and, and renovation. Uh, they, the Department of Health has just launched an initiative to uh, make their stairwells much more accessible and, and find ways in which to make it sort of the first line of thought as using the stair rather than using the elevator. And they, are, they have a longitudinal study to look at the um, uh, health benefits of that shift in those buildings. And so it'll, it'll take a few years before the data is really you know, solid, but I think we'll, we'll find that people uh, who walk stairs are going to have health, all the indices are going to be healthier than ones who do not. I knew we should have taken the stairs on the way down instead of the We elevator. should have taken the stairs. 
Um, well, Vivian, that was a great transition. Um, the, you're a key contributor to the development of the intelligent um, workplace, a living laboratory of commercial building innovations for performance. Can you tell us a little bit about this work, um, what you're measuring, and any relevant findings? Okay, so I have, I'm at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, and I have the privilege of working in a living laboratory. It's uh, 7,000 square foot rooftop, uh, sort of a penthouse glass overlooking the campus. It's a beautiful space um, that's highly daylit and completely uh, armed with innovation and uh, tradition in terms of uh, green technologies uh, with a lot of sensors and controllers hanging all over the place. Uh, and the, the lab is all about testing innovation and seeing how well it works. And there are PhD students who do studies on acoustics and on lighting and on thermal comfort and on next generation control systems and simulation tools for showing how well this works. Um, and a couple things that are pretty clear to all of us who work there, um, uh, for one, we don't turn the lights on at all, um, except when it's night. Uh, and uh, it's wonderful to work in a space that is completely daylit. Uh, it, it's uh, somehow far more energizing. I've never seen anybody sleep at their desk, despite the fact that there are long hours at a university, just because there, there's a sense of, of um, there's an energizing characteristic to daylight itself. Uh, we have had uh, the chance to, of course, monitor energy and. We're running about 10% of the lighting energy of a traditional office, uh, and that's because we run at night. Uh, truthfully, if we worked uh, with the sun, we could, we could be at zero lighting, right? It's, just, it's really quite impressive what you can achieve. Uh, we've done some studies to look at the importance of acoustic. We're, it's an open plan office, so for those of you, I'm sure there are many people here who work in open plan offices. One of the biggest challenges in the open plan is the acoustic distraction. And as we slowly lower the panels in order to have better daylight and better views, we, of course, increase the level of distraction. So we have been looking at the criticality of the absorbing materials in the panel. We look at the height of the panel. And um, it turns out that there are some critical thresholds of, uh, of height that do make a difference. Um, ideally, of course, you start to look at ways in which you can make glazed closed offices, which is something Bank of America has a tradition of where, where you don't rob your adjacent um, employees and, and your collaboration spaces of daylight, but you do allow people to have sliding doors or, or do big doors that they can close when they need to do concentrated tasks. So there is a really interesting set of issues about um, privacy and collaboration and how we make both of those work. But it, it's, a, it's a laboratory building, and it's actually open for anybody who happens to be up in Pittsburgh, uh, so you can see exactly the kinds of technology. We're, we're looking at some biosensing thermal controllers, where you'd literally put on a wrist bracelet and it would, it would measure um, uh, your skin temperature, which is an indication of whether you're too hot or too cold, and it would allow people who are infirmed, uh, who can't get up and turn the uh, thermostat to have a way to automatically control it. And there's that kind of research going on. It's really fun. It's a wonderful place to work. Well, the future is now, where yeah. <clears throat> they're measuring um, our temperature as we walk through the building. Well, actually, that's a great segue to one of the first questions that I had is that, and, and this, at this point, I think this is going to be an organic discussion with all of us, and so I encourage you all to jump in, but when you're looking at investigating if a green commercial building, is indeed, or a federal building for that matter, um, is indeed a healthier one, what should you be measuring? What are some of the indicators of, of the, whether it's, it's um, healthy or unhealthy? You want me to go first? Sure. Yep. I've got a crib sheet uh, because <laughs> the reason I have a crib sheet is that there's actually uh, one of the challenges of measuring um, health in buildings is you have to have a baseline. Um, and uh, if you take something like absenteeism as an indication of health, you have to know what is the average absenteeism in, in your workforce or in the U.S. workforce so that you can see whether your building has higher levels of absenteeism or not. And it turns out, of course, American absenteeism is the lowest in the world, in the industrialized world. Nobody stays home when they're sick. We all go to work because uh, either we're, we're too nervous about losing our job or the workload doesn't disappear. So you may as well go in and slog your way through, even with a cold or um, uh, respiratory, you know, with, with uh, allergies or whatever it might be uh, causing uh, your concern. Uh, there are also uh, the classic respiratory issues, and those are the ones where, uh, and, and I know that Bank of America has been challenged with this question of how do you figure out what it's costing the organization to pay for allergies? Adult onset asthma is a growing phenomenon. There are more adults with asthma now, and it continues to grow, which is a little shocking, and you wonder whether it's the building that's doing it. And so um, if we can get a baseline for how much asthma there is in the workplace and what it's costing the employer, then you can start to look at healthier green buildings having lower asthma rates. 
I, I think also if you think about the, if you think about federal buildings, I mean, to, certainly all, all of us are in Washington, D.C., so you see office buildings all over the place, but if you think about all of the different federal agencies, you know, we also have a community with the Veterans Administration and that at this point is, is uh, building a lot of hospitals and uh, medical care facilities to take care of our returning veterans and uh, our aging veterans as well. And VA, like all federal agencies, has a very strong commitment um, to sustainable building practices and really creating wonderful healing spaces for people when they when they come home or when they have challenges so in those kinds of environments uh, there's some unique opportunities to also look at patient outcomes um, associated with the facilities and um, the health and well-being that we're able to foster among that community of people that we're serving as well uh, one of the other one of the other financial leaders in greening buildings is PNC they've done 53 branch banks and they interview all our employees and say how satisfied you are across a bunch of measures. They're subjective, but they really are pretty consistent in terms of how people respond over a group. Um, and 98% of their workers in these 53 green branch banks um, are uh, consistently more satisfied and more comfortable than in non-green buildings. It's really a remarkable statistic. Um, a couple comments. If you think about structural inequality in this country, we have this very high level of unemployment. If you are struggling economically, your kids are probably in, in uh, rental housing or, or compact spaces that are probably not very well lit, not very comfortable. They may be going to schools that are uncomfortable and unhealthy. So one of the challenges is how to get green buildings and green design, healthy design to people who are less well off. Um, there's an initiative called Green Communities. I had the uh, good fortune of being the principal advisor and creating what's, I think, the consensus standard around green affordable housing. We've done 20,000 units of it. Um, and the measurements off of those in terms of health, in terms of sickness, in terms of respiratory uh, problems, in terms of sick days uh, are dramatically better than conventional. Um, so the data set on this has really become very large. Um, and again, if you think about structural inequality in this country, there's really no better way to address it than through the combination of housing on the one hand and schools and the other where, where the health benefits at this point are really quite measurable and noticeable, uh, including again in, in uh, things like school performance, test scores, and sick days. I think um, I mentioned earlier that you know, we're looking at, at medical records and we're looking very, you know, we're gonna look very closely at visits to the doctor, but as you noted, Vivian, you know, we don't, we don't often go to the doctor or stay home when we're sick. We just keep on trucking and we, we go to work. And so I think what's going to be important is you, you mentioned um, at one point earlier in a survey asking people, how have you felt? You know, you, you asked satisfaction, but we're actually going to ask about symptoms, not just did you go to the doctor? And I think that we're going to get at some really interesting things because we're going to be able to to tell actually how people are doing. But in addition to that, the other layer is if people are coming to work and they're not healthy, their productivity will not be as great. So the first layer would be the survey to track the health effects or the symptoms. And then the, the second layer would be the productivity and looking to see if people are going to work when they're sick, their performance is not going to, to be as great. So I think that's another element of what we're going to be tracking. So let me jump in there because there's something about the, the symptoms. Uh, user, user surveys are a way to gather real information that is linked to health. And uh, it's very hard to get a building owner to agree to hand out a symptom survey because they, they're, feared, they're fearful for, really for liability. If you find out that you've got a lot of symptoms, you know, are you held liable for it? On the other hand, uh, the, the Scandinavians and, and the Europeans have been developing a suite of questionnaires that basically ask, you know, how frequently do you have any of the following symptoms? And, and they'll ask you, do you have them daily, weekly, monthly, once a year, never? And it'll include such things as colds, flus, uh, stiff neck, um, uh, you know, itchy, dry skin, uh, uh, tired eyes or, or blurry vision. I mean, you'll, just a series of symptoms. And then what happens, of course, is you, you, most of them you'll say, I never have them, or I have them once a year. Or, uh, but some show up as frequent. And it's in those symptom uh, databases that you start to see where you've got a building that has got a, a greater set of uh, health concerns. Uh, and it also will show up that your green buildings are going to uh, have less. And th they are, there are some owners that have been willing to distribute those kinds of questionnaires, including Bank of America. And I think it's really going to be an interesting um, 
data set, there's good European and Scandinavian proof that user perception of symptoms does correlate to actually doctored measured symptoms. So it's, you know, people are pretty good gauges of their own health. Then what are some of those? This might be a good time to ask, what are some of those corollaries? What's, <clears throat> in a traditional workplace, um, the, in a non-green building, what is, what, what's making us sick? I mean, we talked about some of these things, about air quality, we talked about access to daylight, what um, the, or lack thereof. Um, we had talked about earlier in a conversation of um, Vivian, you had mentioned um, the old fluorescent lights that have that buzzing noise that correlate to headaches, um, the, the a consistent rate of headaches for employees. Can we um, um, unpack some of those a little bit more? Sort of what, what is making us sick in, in, in the traditional workplace um, and what can we do about it? What are the solutions? You want to start? Mm -hmm. I, I will say by way of advertising that, um, uh, that, that <laughs> uh, <laughs> that Vivian um, and her team have put together, I think, the largest, uh, most rigorous database on peer-reviewed studies on, a cor on correlation between some aspect of productivity and health and then some aspect of high performance or green design, whether it's acoustic or lighting or individual controls. It's really the, the first place to go to on that. Um, as a segue, I will say in the book, one of the things we do is we've got a whole section on health facilities, and it's interesting in these variety of health institutions, hospitals, a whole variety of caregiving institutions. Uh, people recover faster in these kinds of buildings, partly because of view or because of individual controls or lighting type issues. And it's, you know, and here we are with health, exploding health care costs, yet a relatively fast payback from greening these health facilities. The secondary benefits are so much larger in terms of financial impact. You have a day less in the hospital, faster recovery time. Uh, less likelihood of picking up additional sicknesses, that kind of thing. And it's not very well quantified to the extent we are able to quantify it. The financial impacts are very large. I think that, um, you know, Lisa said something early on uh, when you were talking about um, sort of what you know to be true but you can't measure. I'm sure that everybody in, their, in the audience as you were asking that question has your laundry list of things that you know make you feel less than great. Uh, whether you're in the workplace or going into a hotel room, um, or uh, even going into a home. Certainly, all of us had the um, epiphany of fantastic chairs as the Herman Miller Aeron spread throughout the world. And, and I know the first time I had an actually a really nice office chair, I wanted to put a little motor on it and be able to drive it home. But um, you know, we all have those experiences in our daily lives and, our, and, and in the workplace particularly, and, and to, to a large extent too. I believe it's important to recognize that the way that we um, address not necessarily specific, uh, specific aspects of design or construction uh, that may be related to some sort of symptomology, uh, but uh, that, the, that the fact that we're thinking about these issues and um, that we're setting standards for ourselves in terms of uh, the commitment that we have, it's speaking as the federal government, um, not only to um, our employees and to our military personnel, but also to leading by example and demonstrating that, um, that uh, sustainable building practices, and I would also say sustainable operations and maintenance, because you can build a fantastic structure and uh, not operate it effectively and end up with some of the same issues. It communicates a lot about the extent to which we're really respecting and caring for not only our employees, but people who are coming into the building every day, uh, social security offices around the country, um, uh, rural extension offices from the USDA, and as I mentioned, our, our Veterans Administration that has health care facilities around the country for folks who've served in the armed services. You know, it's an important message as well. So let, me, let me pick a few examples of really um, very, uh, the, where the science is really clearly known. Uh, one is if there's definite mold, uh, if you can see visible damp dampness in mold, there is a very direct correlation between uh, mold and, and uh, asthma and allergies. So, and part of the reason why public housing, um, you know, there's such a critical need for replacement is that a lot of the public housing has significant water damage and mold uh, conditions, in addition to pests that go along with water damage and mold. Um, another uh, area where there's a lot of research that's, that's been done is the importance of increasing the amount of fresh air. And uh, whether it's through the mechanical system or through windows that open, uh, the quantity of air we've been delivering has not been adequate. And so uh, the, the research in Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratories has done a, a, a wide uh, overview of what happens when you increase outside air rates. And, and pretty much you could triple it and see a continuous improvement in, in respiratory health. 
Um, then uh, one of my favorites, of course, is, is the access to daylight and view. And, uh, and that's an area where actually the, the research is unclear about whether it's the daylight component that's so important to um, uh, very, uh, uh, elements of human health or whether it's the view component. But nonetheless, <laughs> access to nature, uh, I, I, one of my life's goals is to make windowless offices illegal um, and basement offices and all the things that go along with windowless offices because ultimately we are like any, any living um, uh, uh, element, we really do uh, respond to photosynthesis. And some of the hospital studies that Greg was alluding to are showing very clearly that um, pa patients in southeastern facing rooms specifically um, uh, have much shorter length of stay in the hospital than ones who are facing in other orientations. And it really has to do with the fact that early morning light triggers uh, melatonin production, which helps our sleep cycles, and which in, in turn sleep helps our recovery cycles. And so, there, you know, I think access to nature is a really important thing for us as designers to really aspire to. And certainly green buildings have a very um, great attention to the notion of daylight and, and of course, views of landscape, beautiful spaces. That actually answered, we had an emailed question in from Gretchen and Alexandria that kind of answered that of being stuck in a dark cubicle all day can feel like prison and make people dread going to work. Don't you feel it's important to provide open work areas where people can go and sit in front of a window for an hour um, and be even more productive? So, indeed. Indeed. Um, I know um, as part of the um, Bank of America Tower at One Bryant Park, um, air circulation is a really important um, mm -hmm. issue. Can you talk a little bit more about that um, and um, what the motivation was behind that on air Absolutely. quality? Absolutely. So it, it's, it's pretty funny, you know, in New York City, I don't think it's a stretch, I mean, anything would be better than the air outside in New York City probably, right? But, um, um, but I think that it was very important when we thought about the building, we thought about it as one giant air filter. And so, you know, if you've seen some images of the, of the building and some renderings, um, you know, the idea was that the air coming, the, uh, the air would be, um, would be 100% better than the, than the air that's coming in, the air that would be inside. And, um, and again, you know, going back to the, the thing that we know, we really knew that if we provided this unbelievable um, clean air for our associates inside the building, that it would be a better um, experience for them and it would be a better work environment for them. So it absolutely was one of the most important things. There, there are a few elements of that. It's not just the filtration of the air, but it's also um, the way that the air is delivered within the space. So it's an underfloor air system. And so when we talk about health, you know, one of the things, uh, um, you know, that, that air that's always beating down on you when you're in a, a traditional workspace, um, it's also bringing down a lot of allergens and, and germs along with it so that they're all, you know, they're spinning around the room and then they're coming down and they're landing right on you. Underfloor air um, actually uh, would prevent that. It wouldn't have the same airflow. Um, and we also have uh, an ability for each associate to control his or her airflow or the level of air. So a lot of the hot and cold calls, a lot of times, you know, this person runs really hot, this person runs really cold. This way, the, each person can adjust the airflow to his or her liking. So that's another, it's not necessarily health related, but it also adds to the satisfaction and the enjoyment of the space. Before we <clears throat> all have the bands that then can automatically modulate that. So. <laughs> Why don't, I think this is a great time to actually um, take some questions from the audience. We do have a microphone and we are recording it. Um, so Elizabeth is in the back. Elizabeth, there's a couple questions up front. Um, if you could wait until the microphone comes to you. There you go. Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, thanks for your comments. The, the focus so far seems to be, uh, understandably, on making us feel better and be healthier and more productive. Um, is this coincidentally, by magic, um, happen to also be better for the planet, or are we going to have to sell that uh, by using these things? So, is a is a um, the healthier building, as we're talking about, um, if I understand your question correctly, um, as a sustainable building, also better for the planet? Because yeah. we have been focusing on right. on health, but. Um, yeah, and Greg, abs if you can absolutely. I mean, it's interesting. Energy efficiency upgrades of buildings reduce energy use by 20 percent. The average energy use reduction in a green building is about 35 percent. 
18 of the buildings that we looked at had energy efficiency improvements of above 50 percent. A third of those used on-site renewables. So the average energy use and therefore the average CO2 in those 18 buildings was a two-thirds to 70 percent reduction at a cost premium of three or four percent. Payback was 4x over 20 years. So we're really moving into a world of zero net energy buildings. Uh, I probably look at 250 business plans a year. Uh, venture capital funding has gone up eightfold in the last eight years in this area. We're really looking at the technology solution set that gets you to zero net energy buildings cost effectively. It's coming down the road at us very fast. We're looking, I just joined the board of a company which is the first viable building integrated wind technology. Um, if you look at where California is going with this, California has put, put $175 million into zero net energy, zero carbon, zero climate change buildings with 60% water use reduction, recycled materials, much lower CO2 emissions. Uh, that mandate has been picked up in uh, Massachusetts. GSA is targeting zero net energy buildings and the European Union have a target of 2019 for zero net energy residential construction. So this very slow and static industry called uh, construction, which is by some measures a seventh of our economy or an eighth of our economy, is going through a very rapid transformation to not only make buildings healthier, but to make them much less uh, damaging environmentally. I think if you, if you think about some of the design features that folks have shared up here too, and you can see it as a very, um, very beneficial, very self-reinforcing cycle. You know, if you're using more daylight and uh, less uh, electric lighting, uh, you're using less energy. Um, and ultimately, depending on what your source of energy is, that's going to be bringing down the climate impacts associated with that energy use as well. Um, if you have uh, more effective ventilation and you have a more comfortable space and uh, one that's going to you know, make you breathe easier, literally, then uh, you've got a building that's probably much more energy efficient and, and one that's performing much more effectively as well. Uh, so it's one of those nice opportunities where you can actually have your cake and eat it too. Low calorie cake. <laughs> and I th actually, I think the material toxicity issue, which is the one where, where you look at paints and adhesives and you look at uh, materials that, that you can't actually trace the chain of custody, you don't know where they were manufactured, under what circumstances. Uh, the, the, the whole notion of a green building is to eliminate uh, those question marks and make sure that you're dealing with materials that do not outgas chemistry that is, that's, that's unhealthy for humans. And, and that, I think, uh, has, in the long run, a positive benefit to, um, to, the, to the planet, not only because of the people who are manufacturing those materials not, no longer having to work with toxic substances, but eventually most of our building materials end up in in landfill or in our, in our water stream and, and trying to eliminate toxicity will have a positive benefit on, on, the, on the planet. I think there were a couple more questions. Actually, there's one right in front. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. Uh, I've got a couple of questions about uh, uh, things that would go into the survey. Um, when you're asking about um, visits to the doctors, are you, are you distinguishing between wellness visits and sick visits, like people who, like for instance, I go to an acupuncturist just to keep things in balance so I don't have as many other issues, but there are other wellness visits as well. Correct me if I'm wrong, Vivian, but it's my understanding that in terms of the visits to the doctor, that's being done um, through, uh, not through the survey, that's being done through statistical information that's being delivered in a, in a um, way without any private or personal information just number of visits for, the, for this number of associates. Mm -hmm. so, so that wouldn't have that, um, I guess, subjective bias that could be introduced there. Okay. Well, just something to think about. The other one, uh, the other second question I have, um, the, uh, uh, obviously bringing the outside in, do, is, is, are any studies being done about actually getting people out of the building? So that, I mean, if I can't have my lunchtime walk, I don't care if it's raining, I gotta get outside, I've gotta breathe real air, I've gotta just get away from everything. Is anything being studied about actually getting people out of doors, you know, in addition to all the other benefits? There's actually a, a number of studies that are looking at school children and how important it is for them to get out, out of doors. Uh, and actually also early in the morning for the melatonin production in, in direct sunshine. 
Uh, and it, it, both the go, getting outdoors and the quality of the environment that you walk through, the, the, the density of the trees, the canopy, the, the amount of green space, uh, walking in the parking lot would not have the same uh, overall benefit as walking in a, in a park. Uh, there are some studies, and it's, a, it's beginning to um, increase in number. Again, most of them have focused on school children because we know that our kids are very deprived of outdoor activity. And, um, we, uh, there's also a lot of data linking uh, the type of community you're in. That is, is the only way you can get anywhere by driving, or can you actually walk to places you want to go to? The correlation between living there and obesity and diabetes is very clear. There's very strong data on it by some measures. The unmet market demand for walkable space is around 30% of all buildings. The availability is an order of magnitude less. So. If you look at, at the actual clearing prices in both sales, lease rates, and then things like occupancy and turnover, for buildings that have those attributes, green buildings and urban walkable space, the price premiums on those are very large, on the order of 40%. And so the market is starting to signal very clearly, I think, to the private sector that the lower risk, higher return design strategy is one that enables walking. Uh, that has mixed use, high density, transport oriented, and I think the entire, most of the building community is starting to reorient around this new thesis. I think we had um, one question in the back and then perhaps we'll get into more conversation and then break again. Please, yes. sir. Uh, my name is Milton Grenfell, I'm an architect, and you know, my study of this subject is that um, a lot of the problems of the, the kind of building types that are making us sick now are due in large measure to cheap oil. When we built traditionally, we built a type of building that didn't make people sick, that gave you plenty of fresh air and natural light, and were made with organic materials because they were cheaper, because there, there were no cheap petroleum-based materials around. Um, so my suggestion is, in hearing your, um, your various analyses of the problems, it seems like there's a lot of reliance on technology and science, which you might argue is what got us into this problem to begin with, what I would argue is that there should be some research into traditional ways of building, which kept us healthy and whole for centuries. Are you doing that too in your research, or is it only looking into the future of gadgets? Can we not look back to the way we used to live? I think it's a great question. I think much of the um, sustainability movement, for instance, is, is we're having to relearn some of those ways that we used to build buildings. This building. Um, many of you might know, was originally a green building. It was designed for natural ventilation. For every two minutes, the air would be circulated in the building, and it was done primarily for health reasons. And in all of our wisdom, we've sort of locked up everything with really expensive, energy-intensive um, the HVAC systems. But um, I'd put that to the panel, sort of what are we, um, how are we looking back and relearning some of those lessons again, where um, perhaps we shouldn't um, build everywhere with energy-intensive HVAC systems and so forth. Well, I happen to agree with you. I think the high-tech solution and, uh, has been overstated and the, and the passive solution has been understated. Um, and most of your historic uh, structures were very regional. They weren't built on a national scale. You understood when you were in the desert in the Southwest what architecture was like for a climate that had you know, a 50-degree Fahrenheit delta between day and night, and you'd start to build with very heavy materials with adobe and masonry materials that were that that gave you a lag um, and in many respects that's a far better strategy than than putting in a super efficient uh, heat recovery uh, or ice storage system um, so i think you're absolutely right there is a balance in here of understanding um, uh, the passive strategies in many respects i would love to unplug buildings design them for nothing and then you get to add something for those moments when when uh, you know sort of uh, what I call environmental coasting doesn't work. So we want to coast on the environment as long as we can. But it requires a lot of regional design. It can't be done by, you know, cookie cutter. I'm doing a hotel chain and I've, I've built a brand. You have to really think about what is the hotel like in, in each of these climates. So a very good point. And there is, I mean, the historic, certainly the National Trust for Historic Preservation, a number of the historic uh, organizations have begun to look at how do you quantify the value of historic solutions so that people sort of rediscover them and certainly preserve them, like this building, try to take it back to its original intent? I think the green building movement's been terrific about driving uh, 
uh, people back to saying, how's this building oriented? What are the resources available? Um, there's been a, a big growth in use in thermal mass, things like trom walls, natural ventilation, fans, uh, porches, use of ground source heat pumps. And that's partly because of the design approach and partly because if you're forced to reduce energy usage and go down to a watt a square foot on lighting, you've got to get smart about how you do do uh, daylight harvesting, for example. So I think the, the, the most exciting buildings are one that are very smart about using mm -hmm. uh, local resources, are very responsive to the specific climate, respectful of traditions, which are also tend to be good on energy efficiency, but also incorporate intelligent design like smart controls. We have a company we invested in that allows you on your iPod from anywhere to control your energy use in your house, uh, heating, cooling, lighting. Um, we're essentially moving into a world of virtual grids where the utilities pay you a bit to control the timing on your appliances. So we have an investment in a company called Tendril. All of those devices are going to all of the GE appliances, which will allow you or a utility to control when you do heating, when you do cooling, when you do washing, so that instead of building uh, power plants that pollute and aren't used very much, you're essentially creating virtual distributed load that goes out into the homes and gives the homeowner the financial benefit of allowing the utility to avoid these large capital cost investments. So it's a combination of traditional smart design and then sophisticated data intensive design that gives you very tight control on an integrated and individual appliance basis over your energy using equipment. I think there, there's some good examples as well just within the, the, uh, the federal community where your colleagues at GSA or uh, even within DOD are really beginning to lead by example in this realm. Um, one that, uh, well, um, certainly all the architects in the room probably know about is the um, federal courthouse building in San Francisco uh, that uses almost entirely natural ventilation. And uh, it's very a very um, bold decision uh, to go in that direction. It was the first building, uh, tall building, particularly to be built. I'm looking at Don, so to, like shake your head if I'm saying this wrong. Um, the first tall building to be built in San Francisco without air conditioning in something like 50 years. And uh, I was actually able to be there in person and, and toured a little bit earlier this year. And it's a comfortable space. Um, a very comfortable space, not exactly traditional design, uh, but uh, uses some, some uh, older technologies, more traditional technologies. There's some wonderful examples, too, in places that you might not expect them as well. Um, the the uh, Department of Defense community and the military services in particular are leading by example in some extraordinary ways in uh, the way that they're looking at um, I know this is getting a little bit a field of health, but it comes back around to it ultimately for the people who were there. But uh, the way that they're looking at the natural resources that they have in their installations around the country. You know, they're usually not in, in um, big cities. They're usually not just in small towns, but they are small towns in and of themselves. Uh, Fort Hood in Texas is something like $10.8 billion of economic value to the state of Texas every year. It's really extraordinary what their scope and scale is. But it gives them some unique opportunities to look at things like net zero housing at Fort Bliss uh, that's going to be bioregionally appropriate, or 500 megawatt <laughs> solar installations in, um, where is that, Fort Irwin. Uh, also in Texas or California, Fort Irwin anyway, Army base, you know, taking advantage of natural resources to be able to, um, you know, potentially go off the grid. And um, there, there's more of a resurgence of that sort of practical and very regionally and place-based approach uh, to addressing these issues as well. And we'll have an opportunity to see that come to pass here in D.C. as well um, with the build out of St. Elizabeth's campus. Uh, which is a very important historic campus, uh, not only the buildings itself, but also the landscape design and the view sheds that are there. And that'll be the DHS uh, headquarters. And uh, ground just broke on that actually about a week ago. And uh, they'll be bringing 14,000 DHS employees uh, to work there at the end of the day. And it'll be an extraordinary opportunity of um, uh, traditional design, historic preservation, and adaptive reuse going into making not just a, uh, a, a set of sustainable buildings, but something that should be a, a tremendously positive benefit to the community overall. If I could just add, you know, going back to uh, the idea of something more simple, and, and let's not have gadgets, and let's, let's uh, just uh, go back to the basic needs. Um, one thing that we found that was very curious when we, when we went through and did some design standards that really were much smarter and much more sustainable standards is we, um, 
<laughs> we found that we had often value engineered out light switches from our space, which sounds ridiculous and hilarious, but what we found was it was much cheaper to not put a light switch in. You know, we saved a whole bunch of money because we're renovating space and there's no light switch and then we could just do this, you know, automated sort of. Um, but we found that when we brought the light switch back, which seems <laughs> fairly simple, it's not nearly as fancy perhaps as some of the technology you guys are talking about, but we found that people actually enjoy the ability to turn off the light and we find a lot of people sit either in their offices or in their cubes or in conference rooms just with the lights off and they just prefer to use the daylight. And something that simple and basic has really I, revolutionized a lot of our workspace where you find you walk through and people are just perfectly happy to be sitting there with the daylight and without the, uh, so, so I guess, you know, it's not all fancy gadgets. There are some just really basic, simple people just like to sit there and sit in the light of the window. And as we're looking at, um, this is a good segue in both those comments. Um, as we're looking at, <clears throat> we've been talking a lot about the, um, the physical health. We haven't, um, we've touched upon mental health as well, but um, on green facilities. But, um, and as a, I was thinking about that with St. Elizabeth's, which of course was a historic mental health facility, as well as access to daylight um, mm -hmm. the, and, and what that does for um, the um, relaxation and um, clearing the mind. What studies have been done on, um, the, on green buildings um, impacting mental health? Vivian? Well, um, I'm or not... Or have there been? Yeah, I'm not so sure there have been. I think that there are certainly aspects of, of uh, research that's looked at, at anger and aggression, um, specifically, again, in school children and trying to understand whether the physical environment contributes to that, which it does. I mean, you have a, have a noisy, a sort of hyper-lit or over-lit environment um, uh, with, with a lot of visual distraction, you can find higher levels of, of aggression. I can, we were talking before about whether um, if you design uh, bank uh, retail centers, whether you might find that, you know, because people often are waiting for a long period of time to get up to the teller, and the question is, does the physical environment reduce the amount of sort of pent-up irritation with, I've been here for 45 <laughs> minutes, and, and could you, in fact, look at, um, uh, again, anger and aggression are not good things. And if you bring it into the workplace or you bring it into the school, we're dealing with things that are, it's, it's a form of mental health. And I think there's a little more there than there has been in, in um, some of the uh, other forms of mental health issues that I know of. I, I we did, uh, we did a, I think it's actually the first study. I don't know if I mentioned I have a book for. <laughs> right, uh, Thanks, Greg. We've gone a good 25 minutes <laughs> there, I think, with that. So we did, um, I think it's the first study. We did it with a bunch of religious institutions about, uh, there's sort of two balance sheets. One is sort of the cost effectiveness, and the second is this kind of spiritual uh, impact of religious institutions, very broad range of institutions uh, for going green. And um, it's sort of the comments and impacts were really um, I think moving. They talked about uh, aligning the values of their religious institution um, with their mission by building green. In some cases, the communities grew threefold, belonging to an institution they felt like they were being engaged, that the issues they cared about and the kids cared about were being addressed. There was a sense of, they, was, they weren't so explicit about mental health, but very clear that the spiritual health, the sense of well-being, a sense of engagement, sense of responsibility was being engaged in religious institutions that went green in a way that they hadn't anticipated and that clearly have kind of very positive mental health impacts. Um, and those, some of the quotes that come out of religious institutions that have done that, I think are, are very moving and speak to a sense of individual and sort of community well-being. Um, shifting gears just a little bit, um, the um, two um, from some of these studies to the marketplace itself. Um, the, um, are we seeing, and maybe this is a question um, for both Greg and, and Lisa, but are we seeing, um, but please chime in for everybody, are we seeing the private market, market and developers begin to market beneficial health impacts of green design? I mean, we certainly have seen um, people, um, developers marketing green energy savings um, of buildings. Are we starting to see that with um, this can be a more productive place for your employees as well? Absolutely, I, I, I think that um, it, LEED certification or a green building pursuit is a great indicator of, of overall of a great building, of one that's better for the planet. There's, you mentioned one that's healthier, um, but also one that's um, more cared for. 
more, mm -hmm. more responsibly um, managed. And so I think that what we're finding, especially as, as um, an organization that leases a lot of space, when we are seeking space, we definitely look to find space that is more um, responsibly managed. And I think there are a lot of indicators. Energy Star is a good indicator. Lead Certification is a good indicator. There are other green building rating systems. Um, and I think they all point to uh, a building that's, that's cared for in a much better way. And what will result is a better experience for the tenant, for us as, as the occupant, um, all the way around. And that includes everything from a healthy uh, experience um, to being cared for if there's an issue in the building. And so I think that when, when we seek out, when we work with landlords, we do ask. We say, is the building lead certified? We do ask about, um, is there a recycling program in place? We ask a lot of questions because they end up being excellent indicators um, for what the building experience will be like. And that could be huge, particularly as we were talking earlier um, this evening, the, for somebody like Bank of America, there's 130 million square feet of um, lease space. That's mm -hmm. enormous. Um, oh, and that's our total. Uh, or your, yeah, your yeah, total yeah, space, right. but nonetheless, um, when you're making those sort of demands, yeah. um, theoretically, um, a developer is going to be responsive to those demands. Ideally, yes. Ideally, yes. <laughs> We'd like to think as a, as a large tenant that we're able to have um, a conversation and drive the conversation in a way that that um, perhaps a smaller uh, occupant might not be able to have. But I also think it's our responsibility because we are such a significant tenant or such a significant user of lease space to have that conversation, to ask, is, is this building lead certified? Do you intend to lead certify this building? Do you have a recycling program in place? Um, it's absolutely our responsibility to drive that conversation. The more times we ask those questions, the more times we have that conversation, the more times that we're finding now that the answer is yes. And oh, of course we are working on that. And they know that that's something that we're seeking. And it, it makes a space and a landlord and a building more attractive to us than, than otherwise would be. And Greg, same question on? Most of the buildings, green buildings, were built by, um, by government and to some extent by NGOs, essentially by entities that were owner occupied. And so that it's only very recent that we've seen market data for buildings that are either built on spec or that turn over. And so you're actually seeing the market pricing them um, for sale or for, uh, for lease. And so it's, rel it's a relatively new phenomenon in the last couple of years. There's sort of two motivators. There's sort of the carrot and the stick, right? I mean, so the, the carrot part is people say this is a healthier building. You're seeing it in you know, places like Battery Park in New York where there's an affirmative, intelligent selling of the green attributes built around health and responsibility and lifestyle choices. Um, and that's a pretty sophisticated urban market. There are probably, a, you know, a dozen markets like that in the country. There's the, the stick part, which is this fear of obsolescence. There's really probably three risk elements to it. Um, first is, you know, energy prices are very volatile. So if you have much lower energy prices now, you're likely to have them in the future because it's much more energy efficient. So there's a kind of a risk reduction strategy that every buyer of, of, a, of a home or a, a leaser, if they're responsible for energy, understands. The second is uh, indoor environmental quality and health. I think that people sense that there's such a large volume of healthily designed buildings that there's a real risk element today in building a building that is unhealthy when you can build a building that's healthy and cost less. It's probably gonna be in this litigious society more and more lawsuits around that issue. There have been quite a few. They tend to be settled out of the court, so they don't get recognized, but they're often pretty, you know, $10 million, multi-million dollar settlements. And the third and probably the most important is obsolescence risk. I mean, this is a 50-year uh, facility, huge capital cost tied up in it. The trends on, you know, on climate change, health and green buildings are very strong. So even if you don't think climate change is happening, even if you think environmental stuff's a bunch of hooey, one building is just like the other, all the stuff about health and comforts nonsense, you still get pause now because you're saying, you know, the trends are in this direction. There's a significant portion of the population that care about this issue. I want them to be tenants as well as the people who don't care. So there's this sort of risk of obsolescence. So I think those three sticks are driving the market as well as what's an emerging kind of an intelligent way to communicate multiple values of buildings. It's not just space and location and marble halls, it's these other dimensions. Um, and that's starting to spread. You're seeing it in national chains, more and more markets. And I think as that emerges, um, and as the availability of green buildings reaches a certain threshold, maybe it's 5%, 
um, that, that's, that the carrot part of this becomes really compelling. And so our sense is that, you know, by 2015, 50% of all non-residential construction will be designed as green by, by square footage in this country. Well, let me, let me jump in here because actually um, uh, Greg alluded to the uh, Battery Park um, housing, that, which is residential, and, and the Solaire project, which, you know, is um, a, a green building in terms of its energy efficiency, I mean, in, in all of its aspects, but the, the real market for those, those apartments was the health. And it was, uh, the stories, when you listen to residents of the, the, that building, and I'm sure there's, there are testimonials actually on the web for Solaire, the stories of the families that decided to move into those apartments, which are not, which were pricey, as are most apartments in New York City, um, they um, uh, incredible improvement in the he health of their kids led to actually a snowballing of requests for housing, and they're, they're now in their third building. Uh, and these are all sort of pre-sold before. I mean, it's a, it's a really wonderful developer story built very heavily on the health aspect. Another um, health aspect that is change the way in which uh, the market has gr grown is in the hospital community. The um, hospital community, a, a subset of hospitals have emphasized what they call evidence-based design. And they've been working uh, very consistently on trying to understand what are the components in a hospital that lead to better health outcomes. And uh, they're actually becoming a research unit, building better hospitals and then trying to test compared to the larger set of hospitals, and they're beginning to market their hospitals based on health outcomes. So I do think that there is a, uh, a growth in the, in the use of, uh, and, uh, and maybe schools will do the same. I mean, it, it's very hard to sell an energy efficient school. Uh, you know, you, it, My son went to college this year, and part of the reason he went to Cornell is they've got a very green program, and it, it wasn't his top factor, but it was like fourth or fifth, that it was green, and you know, his classrooms are going to be green and his dorms are going to be healthy and it's, it's happening. I mean, it's starting. Well, we, Greg, you talked about sticks and maybe I'll ask a um, carrots and sticks and, and perhaps I'll ask a um, controversial question, but um, Europe or Germany has a law in its books that um, employees must have access to daylight, which is now driving new construction. Vivian, you said earlier, um, and perhaps you're being facetiously, but they, um, mm -hmm. that every worker should have access to, Not should be the law. So right. I'd love to hear, um, I'd love to hear thoughts of the panel on that. I mean, should there um, be, um, be a government mandated stick um, be that's demanding some of these? Or should it solely be market driven? Or a combination of the two? Well, dictatorship is the most efficient form of government. So <laughs> um, I was in China a couple months ago as part of this Obama trip. and. You know, the rate of change in government mandates around clean energy, renewables, changes toward green design is really, really encouraging. I know the USGBC's position has not been to advocate for mandates, but effectively, I mean, every big city in the country either has mandates or strong incentives. Um, so uh, I think the market is trending this way, and what's, what's really helpful is, have, is to have transparency. I mean, CoStar which is the large organization that does um, data related to uh, sales and leasing, have added Energy Star and then lead rating uh, so that when people go through it, they start to say, what's this new criteria? What does it mean? How does it perform? Um, so that transparency and consistency of communication around performance metrics um, starts to rise to the top of people's mind as a criteria, which is why USGBC has been so extraordinarily powerful as a transformative institution is because the Americans are very competitive. So by gosh, if my, my bank competitor is getting silver, I'm going to go for gold. And, you know, and that's how we are. You have to appreciate as well the importance of leadership by example. I mean, certainly the organizations represented uh, here, Bank of America with their market scale, and uh, the federal government. Uh, the federal government owns nearly half a million buildings around the country of all sorts of different types. And uh, GSA, uh, the General Services Administration, on its own um, owns or manages something like 1.7% of all the commercial office space in the United States. And, and the footprint isn't just here in Washington, the footprint is around the country. And um, you know, with anything, and particularly in the, in the built environment, and as strange as it is for me to say this still, I think I've been in the building industry for something like 15 years now. And um, it's a, uh, it's, it's a very traditional industry in many regards. 
and um, the project timelines are long, and there's a small army of people involved in constructing or doing a major retrofit on, on any one building. And there are a lot of people who've been in the interest industry for a lot longer than I have as well. So I think it's important to appreciate that where we are right now in understanding the benefits of sustainable design and construction, and uh, Im very importantly, uh, the benefits of sustainable operations, not only in our, in our big buildings, in our commercial buildings, but also in our, very, in, our, in our own homes, you know, whether we live in condos or apartments, single family homes, you know, whatever your housing looks like. Um, we're still fairly early on in discovering this. I mean, even as I'm sure that uh, you all have gathered as we've talked about what kind of research might be available. I mean, research is still emerging. And uh, one of the key challenges has been finding apples to apples comparisons to be able to answer some of these questions. Although, as the gentleman in the back of the room observed, uh, a lot of times the design decisions that uh, we're making that have better outcomes for people uh, are actually the, the things that are common sense as well. And um, leading by example, whether it be in a, in a small way uh, with what we choose to do with our own homes, uh, for those of you who are in the building industry and make bigger decisions that have impacts on more people, or what we do as workers in the workspace in understanding that the decisions that we make about our, our cube or our little desk have an impact on the people around us too and take some accountability and responsibility for that. Um, just as you know, we as the federal community are working to do um, exactly along the lines of what the president has asked us in his executive order, you know, all of those create positive momentum in a very important direction and uh, positive momentum not only in terms of the ability to influence the marketplace. You know, I'll pick on the General Services Administration again, uh, $5.5 .5 billion in the Recovery Act uh, to invest in communities around the country in high-performance sustainable buildings. And uh, that's market momentum and that's jobs. And uh, importantly, that's not just uh, clean energy jobs. Uh, those are also jobs that are going to give people the opportunity to learn how to do things better and differently in a way that's going to have better outcomes from an energy performance perspective, absolutely, uh, but also for the people who are using and occupying those buildings. I would also just add, you know, I think that you alluded to something, Greg, when you mentioned that um, your son was choosing, which, by the way, I went to Cornell, so I'm very happy to hear that he's there. Um, <laughs> That um, you know that he made a choice based on on the attributes of the school or the buildings there, and I think that a mandate sometimes um, uh, might not drive innovation and the ability for the private sector to distinguish itself in a lot of ways through its innovation and through its its uh, um, development of new um, and innovative ways of of delivering space. And for example, I know that we have new associates who come on who ask, they say, Am I, will I be working in a lead building? Um, you know, they say, you know, what, what are the attributes of the building that I, where I'm going to work? And that is a, a way that people make their decision about which companies to, to work in. I think it's a, um, and we've actually had, and this is, this is a true story, we've had parents call our recruiting department, our HR, and ask, will my daughter, will my son be working in a green building wow. or a lead building? Wow. Which I guess is, I don't know, probably a comment on a few more things, not just on the <laughs> building. But, um, it's but time to so, let go. I know, right? <laughs> so, um, but I think that's something significant. And I think that's something that we heard loud and clear. Our human resources group called us and they said, we got these questions. We don't know. Will these people be working in green buildings, lead? What's that? What do, what do we tell them? And so I think that it's a, it's, it's, there's a lot of innovation and a lot of change that's being driven. You know, so can I, can I jump in here, though, because yeah. I'm not convinced the market will do it all by itself. Um, in fact, I don't think the market has done it all by itself. The federal sector has been a major player in, in moving green buildings forward. And luckily, the owner-occupied companies like Bank of America have been, and, and PNC Bank and others have said, we're going to be a major player. And, and uh, even Walmart today is going to become a major player. So the, the, the um, companies that own buildings. The developer and the speculative market, though, is still pretty driven by least cost decision making. Uh, we do not invest very much in our physical environment. Uh, we build paper stuff that, you know, as far as the, the investors are concerned, if it, if it survives for 10, 15 years, it doesn't matter if it ends up being um, an eyesore. You can literally board it up and just leave, leave it behind. And I think uh, we've got a problem uh, as a nation because we invest far, far less in our physical infrastructure than we do in our, in our desktop technology and our, our cars. And um, 
ultimately, uh, if we're going to continue to do that, we can't even sustain what we've got. Um, we've got too much stuff that's being abandoned. It's time for us to start doing quality, life, long-term decision making. And in some respects, I think those are the kinds of decisions the federal government needs to take. It's on behalf of the population at large. You're looking at the best interests of health. You're looking at the notion that things aren't going to be abandoned. And are, um, you're, you're looking at, you know, at high-speed rail. Uh, you're doing things for the nation at large that cannot be done by, by a series of small private interests. So I, I actually am, not that I think that there should be dictators, um, nor do I think it should be heavy-handed, but I, I do think, such as access to windows, I mean, all of the industrialized nations have mandatory seated views of windows for their workers. Nobody sits more than seven meters from a window. You, there's no question that you get to see whether it's snowing outside. Right? And we, we don't. With that, I'd love to um, maybe end with some more questions from the audience, if we can. Um, Elizabeth, I'm going to let you choose, because I'm having a hard time seeing up here. Um, maybe you can talk about the um, contract industry, the building industry, as to where they are in this whole um, sustainability building. Because I'm on the board of a small homeowners association, and we're looking to try to go green. And just try to find the information and get the contractors to do the stuff is very difficult. Uh, we're also dealing with a property management company in the district that handles a lot of different buildings. And many times when I bring it up, they don't have a clue what I'm talking about. And I don't think that I'm a very educated person in this area, but I seem to know more about it than the contractors do and the property managers. So how, how do we get from here to there? So education of the field as well as just more information both to the field and um, to consumers. Well, it's a great book that you might want. <laughs> you know, there, there is a, a lead yeah. for homes um, and a lead for neighborhood development, um, uh, and, you know, quite a bit of support in terms of this staff at the U.S. Green Building Council. I, I would start there. I would start on their website and then call, say, how do I find, uh, you know, property managers and contractors who have a, a, a track record? You could look for that title block under people who have lead AP. It's surprising how many uh, contractors have gone for their lead uh, accreditation. So I, I think actually in this district, you, you're in pretty good shape. If you were, uh, you know, DC has, has quite a bit of intelligence. You just have to find the right uh, trigger. D and, and actually, if I can, I can um, give a plug for the, for the National Building Museum. Uh, the National Building Museum did a really wonderful exhibit here a couple of years ago on the green home and uh, has some fantastic resources available on its website, both, I think, some archived panels like the ones that we're doing here today and links into other community resources that are, that are much more focused on homeowners, you know, people who might be building new homes, people who might be addressing what their existing homes are. And uh, given the really extraordinary curatorial work and educational programming that this institution advances, I think the National Building Museum's website might be a good place to start as well. The, the DOE, the uh, Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy, has some very good resources. They have very intelligent, non-biased, clear, illustrated descriptions of all of the green building technologies. They have a database of green buildings that are pretty good. Uh, there's a, a group called Environmental uh, Building Network, and they've got a publication that I think is probably the best single publication on this. There are a number of free publications in this space. Uh, that you can get uh, with respect to U.S. Green Building Council. Joining the local chapter, which is 40 or $50, is a wonderful thing to do. There's regular uh, programs, uh, educational programs. There are building tours, so if you signed up, uh, they probably, you'd have an opportunity to go and visit homes or home networks or residential complexes that have gone green. They would talk about how they did it, what technology, what was the process, how did they engage the owner, how did they get around zoning issues. Um, so there are some very good resources like that. And also to add, there the energystar.gov, there are Energy Star homes, and um, since you had a shameless plug, I'll give a shameless plug also that um, if, if you uh, have a Bank of America mortgage and you purchase an Energy Star home, up to $2,000 of your closing costs are forgiven. That's so great. Well, how much is it if it's a lead home? We haven't developed that product just yet, <laughs> sir. <laughs> and one thing that we'll do is after we, we are filming tonight and we'll post um, this online, and when we do post it online, we'll put all of these links up there as well yeah. for you. So, another question. 
Elizabeth is making her way around. Great. Sir. Good evening. Thank you very much for a very good program. I'd like to ask you to come back to the title, which is the link between green buildings and health, as opposed to sort of green buildings as a whole universe of discussion. And we, being building people, we tend to start at the building and then look at and ask whether the people in it are healthy. I wonder if the folks in the panel can talk about whether the folks who do public health studies generally, epidemiology studies, are being um, integrated into this so that when the HHS does general uh, um, demographic baseline studies, which I know they do, are they, or, or could they, also as they do that, ask questions about, granted we've now determined that your health as, a, as specimen 7,369 is such and Could such. Could you speak louder? Could you speak a little louder? Can we have the your, microphone up just a little What is your building time? circumstance that correlates with that health? So can we come back at this from the public health people's point of view and then pull in building information rather than starting from buildings and trying to go toward health? Okay, so let me, let me see if I can try to answer some of that. Um, yes, there are epidemiologists involved in some of these health studies. Um, certainly a lot of laboratory and controlled experimentation is done with epidemiologists. Uh, to some extent, um, the uh, building field case studies involve them. Typically, unfortunately, health problems in existing buildings on the ground uh, end up being court cases, and then the court cases are locked up, so we don't actually learn from our own mistakes. So uh, you know you, you're you're looking at cases where um, where there were, were actually linkages between the the inadequate delivery of fresh air and um, uh, people being uh, having respiratory failure or, or other kinds of, of serious um, health consequences. So uh, yes, uh, the controlled lab experiments almost always involve health officials. Now, in terms of public health agendas. Up until recently, there have been very, very few federal funds that have focused on buildings. Uh, whether it's at NIH or NIEHS or the Center for Disease Control or because their mandate wasn't focused on how do buildings relate to health. So, and that was a s significant failure and shortcoming in the, in the research funding stream. I begin to see that there's a slow shift in that. I think there is beginning to be some uh, uh, modest resources in which the building sector is being invited to collaborate with the health sector to see to, if we can understand what some of the causals. The, uh, most of the um, mold and certainly some of the, the pest, cockroach, other kinds of studies that are looking at the impact on health are done through the public health sector and then joining with the, with the uh, building sector. Uh, the Center for Disease Control, through a few incredible leaders, have managed to start looking at land use and the impact it has on not just obesity, which is a public health epidemic, but also uh, looking at Ritalin use, uh, looking at, at depression and suicide in teens, and, the, and uh, they're beginning to show correlations between gated communities uh, and actual serious epidemic health outcomes. So in answer to your question, there's not a huge history in this country because there was no funding stream that, where it was targeted to the building sector. Now there's a tiny crack in that funding stream, if I could be king for a day, I'd make it 2% of NIH budget, and you would see an explosion. Oh, you would like to do that too? Oh, good. Uh. Can, 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 can I just say that Howie Frumkin is here from CDC, and he's one of the country's leading experts on this. Howie, I don't know if you want us to speak to this issue, but uh, having you here is a fantastic resource. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks, Greg. It, it's amazing to hear you advertise something beside the book. I'm really grateful. <laughs> um, I, I would just have to back up what Vivian said. I think our biomedical research establishment has been very focused on basic mechanistic biomedical research. And that's at the expense of looking at variables like building type or neighborhood type or access to nature and so on. But I agree also that we're seeing a crack in the door. And we're seeing more and more interest in the federal government, both at NIH and at CDC, on the kinds of health-promoting exposures we've been talking about tonight. So all those with an interest in this area can, can uh, let officials know that this is an important area for research, and I think we'll see it grow in coming years. Thank you, Harry, and welcome. Let's yeah, welcome. I would make a plug for your book, right? <laughs> uh, I think we have time for um, one more question, and then um, we will be up here afterwards. Yeah.
more just wanted to, to add them. something to what Howie said. I'm, I'm with uh, HUD and uh, Office of Healthy Homes. And we just finished um, a small grant competition. We called our Healthy Homes Technical Studies Grants, uh, looking at uh, the effects of green building on health. Um, so uh, HUD is doing that. We, we have a uh, project with CDC. Uh, we're spending uh, two million to look at um, the health and indoor and environmental benefits of green rehab of, of some HUD uh, properties. Mm -hmm. um, so there is more and more interest, and uh, there, there are some funds mm -hmm. uh, at HUD uh, to do that. Um, one question I have uh, related to this, um, HUD is focusing more and more on green rehab, so a question for the panel is, um, what are their thoughts on the uh, wh where you get the biggest bang for the buck? If you just have a few thousand dollars to spend per unit on uh, affordable housing uh, for green rehab, uh, where, do you, where do you get the biggest bang for the uh, buck in terms of health and, uh, and comfort? Hmm. Great question. I'd probably start with cleaning supplies, which cost marginally more and uh, reducing the, I mean, these tend to be, you know, 1,200 square feet, three, four people, so they're relatively small uh, space per person, ventilation's often poor, so stopping to introduce toxics and, and, and things like that's probably a good place to start. Um, uh, in terms of health, um, you know, cleaning. If I mean, uh, the 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 best work I think that's been done on this recently is a group that I know you guys partner with, which is a, a large study that's just come out of uh, enterprise uh, uh, community partners on affordable green affordable housing, and they went through and looked at impact issues and cost issues for uh, thousands of individual units, and uh, I think that's probably the that would be the single resources I'd see, resource I'd suggest you, you look at. I would ask, um, the, as we wrap up, um, for two last things from each of you. We can perhaps um, start with you, Lisa, and go down. Um, closing thoughts, but also um, we've been talking about some pretty big issues and, and some um, larger scale issues. In a way, that question really sets this up. What's the one thing you'd like the audience to take away with you tonight? So given the topic of our conversation, what is the one issue that you'd like the audience to take away? And Lisa, why don't we start with you? Um, well, I think what's most significant is that we um, do uh, continue to push the research and investigation in answering these questions. I think we all, like, like I said before, we, we know this, but we can't prove it. And I think it's important that um, uh, large occupiers of space engage in the conversation, support research, make sure to ask these questions that are tough and we might not want to know the answers, um, but that we continue to um, ask the questions so that we can really help support um, finding out some really good answers and changing the way that we look at space and the way our people occupy space. So um, let me start by just saying that I fundamentally believe that green buildings are as much about health as they are about energy and, and that they're integrally uh, intertwined. And, and one of the surprising things for me as someone who grew up in the energy uh, focus on, on both housing and commercial buildings, how do we make them energy efficient, was discovering really through the, the evolution of, of lead and guidelines that made me all of a sudden talk about water, indoor environmental quality. I mean, there's just a breadth of issues that, that have been put into the green umbrella. Uh, my, for me, the, probably the most urgent thing is to, is to unseal our buildings. Uh, and maybe I'll hark back to the question of, you know, of your classic environmental strategies. I, I, I mentioned the word environmental coasting. If I could convince all of you that coasting with free environmental energies, using daylight for as long as possible, using natural ventilation for as long as possible, using passive solar heating for as long as possible, and then only turning on systems in the time when it's too hot or too cold or it's too polluted or just those windows of time when, it, when nothing else works. If we can coast in our buildings, I think we will find not only a dramatic reduction in our, in our uh, energy and, and carbon footprint, I think we will see significant improvements in human health. I would, I would just offer a, a couple of thoughts, and um, if I might presume to do so too, uh, thoughts on behalf of many of the, the, I mean, not just leaders within the federal community, but thought leaders uh, in, in this space who are representing the audience today from the federal government is, um, you know, 
oftentimes, um, you know, the, the federal agencies, uh, perhaps not so much in DC, but uh, elsewhere in the country, are thought of is primarily in our, our governing function. Uh, but we have a very significant footprint, um, very significant scale, uh, because of the number of employees that we have, uh, the number of buildings, and what our purchasing uh, is every year. So for those of you who are researchers, and for those of you who are part of a community of practice that cares very deeply about the connections between sustainability, uh, sustainable buildings, and, um, and, and better outcomes for people, think of us also as a community of leaders who care very deeply about these issues, uh, not only as it relates to the fundamental you know, work of our mission, I like the wonderful example from HUD, uh, who's uh, also leading together with DOT and EPA and the Livability Partnership that's thinking about a lot of these issues and many others at the community scale, uh, but think of also as potential partners, um, because we do, as, as, a, as a federal organization, have a commitment to openness and to transparency and have a mission-oriented interest in helping to move these issues forward. Uh, we can be effective partners in research and uh, not just funders in research in looking at what are some of these potential outcomes and impacts are across the diverse portfolio of uh, buildings that we own, uh, buildings that we occupy, or, or buildings that we invest in. And certainly from a taxpayer perspective, uh, it's extraordinarily important to us to be uh, demonstrating that case and uh, that our commitment to sustainability, including sustainability in our built environment and the people component of uh, sustainability, is also the responsible decision uh, to be making as uh, stewards of public funds. Uh, I guess a couple comments. One is, um, I think we need to be, um, you know, the, the position we've had today in advocating for green buildings is why we should do green buildings, a bunch of things you can trot out. And I think we have the data to be able to say now that um, it's illogical, uh, fiscally irresponsible, and more risky to design buildings as unhealthy or to retrofit buildings and not make them green. And I think we need to be aggressive about that. And every time we're involved in a, a home or residence or uh, workplace choice related to green design, our message should be, look, it's lower cost, lower risk, et cetera, et cetera. So it's no longer sort of a greeny affirmative, you should because it's morally right. It's that it's fiscally prudent, it is lower risk, um, and it's going to hurt us as an institution if we don't do this. So I think the paradigm shift, the data is there to support it. We should be aggressive about it. The second thing I would say is that if you look at the climate change science, um, pretty much every responsible science, not on the payroll of a coal company, um, is terrified by the data. Uh, if you look at a map at night of the world and see the entire world lit up, it's hard to look at that and not say, you know, you'd expect there to be uh, human-induced climate change. It is a pressing issue to deal with. I would say there's some positive things about it. Uh, first is we can get to zero net energy buildings in the next decade or so. Um, the second I would say, I've got three kids, two at home, is my experience is that people are comfortable accepting uh, scary things like climate change if they feel they can be engaged with it. And that's part of what's driving the school community so rapidly. I have kids at a school that's gone green. My kids are excited about it. They have a sense of engagement. Um, and they're able to deal with the notion of climate change and these other things that are happening that are scary at a time of economic depression and, and dislocation and uncertainty. So it's, a, it's really a very positive me measure, and I think this is true for us as, as adults as well as, as, as for our children, um, is that it's a very exciting time. There's a, uh, there are answers. Those answers make us better off. They make us healthier. They give us a sense of engagement socially um, and allow us to tell a story of optimism that... Uh, that is a real one, and we spend 85, 90% of our time indoors, and so, um, you know, it's a good story, and it's one that resonates for, for everybody of every age, so thank you. Thanks for that uplifting note. I'd like to thank the um, panelists who joined us this evening.